we thank you for that truth that we are set free because of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. Lord, I pray that we would never forget the beauty of the gospel, that we would live every day as a reflection of the gratitude that we have to you. God, we thank you that you are faithful and that you are gracious and that you have allowed us to have freedom through Jesus. God, I pray that we would just continue to to walk in that freedom and to pursue you daily. Well, good morning, Watermark. If you didn't get a chance to tune in last week, my name is Tyler Briggs, and I'm an elder at Watermark Fort Worth, a a seven-year satellite, but a new church plant over in Fort Worth. And it's good to be with you for one more week as we dive uh, into the scriptures as we continue a series called Retold History Everyone Should Know. And have you noticed uh, that all kids want to be heroes? At least I know that my child does, my four four and a half year old does anyway. And at the beginning of all of this coronavirus stuff, we took her to see Frozen 2. It had just come out and and she was a huge fan of Frozen 1. And uh, I think she prefers Elsa and her powers, but prefers Anna's uh, costume. And so we got her a costume of Anna. So when we took her to see uh, Frozen 2, she was all in her gear, ready to go. There she is all sassy uh, like she is all the time. And uh, we went in and she loved the movie. She loved it so much. Uh, and immediately, like as soon as it was over, we, we left the theater and we went to this little play area inside the mall. And there were a bunch of kids there. And immediately she put herself in the role of the hero of Frozen. And, and really, she kind of combined both Anna and Elsa into this one superhero. And you can see another picture of her as Anna, but using Elsa's frozen powers uh, to uh, uh, rescue all the other kids in the play area. And she just loves playing like she's a hero, a hero. And the truth is, um, so do you and so do I. And any story that we read, we like to read it as if we imagine ourselves in the role of the hero. And the reason that I mention that is because this week, as we continue this series called Retold, we are reading a story. We're going to walk through a story that's probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest hero story outside of Jesus himself in all the scriptures. And it's the story of David and Goliath. And if you're anything like me and a lot of other people, there's a temptation when you open to the story of David and Goliath to want to view yourself as David, to want to view yourself as the hero of that story. But I've, I've got some, uh, some bad news for you is that when it comes to the story of David and Goliath, um, you're not David. You don't get to be David. You don't get to be the hero in this story. And the reason why I want to start there is because if your understanding of the story of David and Goliath starts with you being in the place of David as the hero, you're going to end up disappointed with God. Why, why would that be? You're going to end up disappointed with God because you are going to start viewing yourself as a recipient of certain promises of victory that God didn't necessarily give you. There is one big one that he did, and we're going to discover what that is, but we've got to understand who we are and what role we play. And it's also, it's like, um, we don't want to latch on to something and believe certain promises that, that aren't given to us because then we're going to end up discouraged and disappointed and doubting, and it can, it can wreck our faith. So we have to have a right understanding of this story. A little bit of a preview, the story of David and Goliath plays out really in three scenes or three acts. In Act 1, you see the the army of Israel and the king of Israel, Saul, being tested. Their their faith is tested, and uh, we're going to get to see how that that fares for them. And then it transitions into Act 2, where we see God raise up a deliverer for his people. And then in Act 3, as the story finishes, we will see how a delivered people responds to that deliverance. And so it's going to be a fun morning as we dive in and we learn rightly from the story of David and Goliath. And even though like we are not David in this story, we can still learn from him. And so as we go along, there may be a few things that you can pick up to learn from David, even though you are not 
the hero of this story. So we'll start, uh, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 54. And just to set the stage, it's the first few verses. And what we see is the nation of Israel, the army of Israel camped in the valley of Elah. And they're going out to war against the Philistines. And the scene kind of opens up, the act opens up, and you have the entire army of Israel on one mountain, the valley in between, and then the entire army of the Philistines on the other. And when you read it just in the black and white on the pages of the Bible, you can read by that quickly, but you've got to really insert yourself into that moment. And the, the best way that I know how to do that or what comes to my mind to help me realize the situation is I just think about all the, the battle scenes uh, in movies that are kind of throwbacks in the way that warfare used to, used to happen. And particularly, I go back to Braveheart. And in Braveheart, when uh, the Scots and William Wallace, his, rallied, his, ar- his army are on one side of this field, and you have the, 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 the Brits or the English on the other side, and they're rallying up for this battle. And, and, and William Wallace is firing his men up. They're, they're scared, they're anxious. And he, he stands and he gives this speech in front of them. And it kind of ends with this crescendo moment when he says that they can never... They can take our lives, but they can never take our freedom. And all the warriors, all the the soldiers just kind of, ah, and they gear themselves up for battle. And something very similar is happening right now in this story. Uh, But then something different happens. It doesn't follow the same plot as Braveheart. Because out of the uh, army of the Philistines comes a giant. And any kind of courage that the army of Israel and the king of Israel may have had, begins to disappear. And so I'll start in verse 3. It says, The Philistines stood on one side of the mountain, or on one mountain on one side of the valley, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. This would have been, uh, he, he would have been about nine feet, six inches tall. He was huge. And it said that he had a, bronze helmet on his head and he was clothed with scaled armor weighing 5,000 shekels of bronze which would have been about 125 pounds of armor he's like impenetrable and he also had a bronze uh, greaves or guards on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam it's like a two by four and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron which would have been about 15 pounds at the tip of his spear would have been more than enough to, to go through anything that came in front of it. And then it says that his shield carrier also walked before him. So as he comes out and he stands in front of this entire mass of the army of Israel, it says this happened, that he shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. And the Philistine, Goliath, said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And so you see this one particular enemy, Goliath, come out of the army of the Philistines and say, hey, we don't have to see mass bloodshed. I'm going to challenge someone from your nation to a one-on-one battle. This would have been called a champion's duel. Now, who should have been the champion for Israel? When you look at King Saul, if you go back and you look at when King Saul became king, it says that he was uh, head and shoulders taller than than anyone else in the nation, that he was uh, handsome and had the appearance, the appearance of, a, of the outward appearance of a king, of someone as strong, of a warrior. But yet we see in this moment how Saul and the rest of his People respond to this enemy, to this challenge. And it says, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were greatly dismayed and afraid. And they responded in fear. They they looked at the challenge. They looked at the size of the enemy that was in front of them, and they responded in fear. And then if you skip down to verse 16, this didn't just happen one time. It said that the Philistine Goliath came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. For 40 days, he came out and defied Israel. That's significant. Here's why it's significant. Because the number 40, all throughout the scriptures, refers to a period of testing. We see that um, Moses is, is tested as a 
uh, shepherd in, in Midian for 40 years before God raises him up and brings him out to deliver Egypt. We see that um, as the Israelites are approaching the promised land, that they send 12 spies into the land who wander for 40 days to, to see the land, to see if it's what God had promised them, and they come back. And when they were there, they saw giants in the land, the same group of giants that Goliath is a descendant from. And they responded in fear and said, they're, they're too big, we can't go. And so they failed the test. And then because of that, we see the nation of Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years as this one generation dies off and the faith of a new generation is beginning to be uh, tested. And then here again, you see that number show up and you see the nation of Israel tested their faith for 40 days, uh, morning and evening, as this giant comes out and they fell the test over and over and over again. What's also particularly interesting about that, there is something that Jews would have prayed or recited every morning and every evening as being a part of God's people. And it's called the Great Shema. The Great Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and where Moses commands the people of Israel to, to remind yourself of who God is day and night. And the Great Shema reads like this. This is what um, a good... Israelite in the army would have done every morning and every evening as part of their prayers. They would have said, they would have reminded themselves, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And they would pray this morning and evening. That prayer goes on. And after Moses instructs, had instructed Israel in Deuteronomy to pray this prayer, he then tells them why. And he reminds them of a specific promise that God gave them in verses 18 and 19 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And in, Moses had said that if you do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, as you go in to enter and possess this land, even this land where giants are, um, if you do what is right in the sight of the Lord, it may, may be well with you so that when you go in and possess the good land, which the Lord swore to give to your fathers by driving out all your enemies from before you as the Lord had spoken. So, the, the great Shema, the part of this prayer, was a part of the people of Israel, would have been a part of these uh, soldiers, these warriors in the Israelite army, reminding themselves that God had already promised them a victory. Like God had said, hey, I will drive out your enemies before you. But yet they stand up, and then here comes an enemy and that defies their God and defies their army and tests their faith. And what does Israel do? What is their response? It's fear. And they flee and they fail the test of faith. And this is where we have to have a correct view of this story. Because although we would like to read ourselves into the story of David and Goliath as David, we are actually Israel. We are like Israel. And it's easy, like we don't want to be Israel. It's easy to read back through your Old Testament and see all the ways in which they fell and all the ways in which God had shown up to them and be like, how could they do this? Like, how could they keep forgetting who God is and responding out of fear and not by faith. But the truth is, the same way that Israel ended up between a rock and a hard place because they failed the test of faith and then needed to be delivered from the Philistines and from Goliath, we are that same way. We, we have failed the test of faith over and over again. And so my first point is that we need a deliverer because we fail the test of faith as well. And we don't have to think long and hard to know that that's just true. Like a minor observation of our own lives and our own faith would show that, that, that we really are more like Israel than, than more like David. And if you don't believe me, here's just a few, a few examples. Like although we like to, to read ourselves into this story as the hero, we're more like faithless Israel and we, we fell the test of faith. And here's how. You fail the test of faith when you lose your trust in God when faced with hardship. Okay, this is an easy one to look like. Um, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And uh, especially, I think, early on in this pandemic, when we saw the stock market crashing, our economy crumbling, when we were he hearing uh, the, the threat to our health, the, the, the chance of death, uh, especially if you had any underlying health issues, you know, being kind of really, really scary. And all of a sudden, so many of us were just racked with all kinds of anxiety because we saw our security, that was our bank account, beginning to just empty faster than, than we could handle. And we see our health, uh, which is all about our well-being, come under threat, and we're overcome with worry and anxiety, which reveals, which reveals that 
What we were truly putting our hope and our trust in was not God. Our faith wasn't in him. Our faith was in ourselves. It was in our health. It was in our own strength. It was in our own body. And we, and we failed the test of faith because it reveals that we're looking to other things to be our source of hope and our saviors. How else did we fail? You fail the test of faith when you look to worldly solutions to deal with your disappointment. So for instance, whenever you're anxious or depressed, you're going through a hard time and you, and you decide instead of turning to God in prayer, you turn to alcohol or you turn to drugs or you turn to uh, workaholism, whatever the ism may be that you turn to, you turn to something else to be a, that's a false savior and you fail the test of faith because you forget who your God is. You also fail the test of faith when you let fear paralyze you from being faithful. And if you don't believe me, you just think about, uh, has there ever been a time when you came into someone and God began to open a door for you to have a spiritual conversation with them and you felt this like this prompting from the Holy Spirit to engage them in a spiritual conversation. But like you, you had this like weird feeling come up and your response was not to share the gospel, but more was like, mm, no, I'm not doing that because I'm not sure how they're going to respond to me. And you end up not sharing the love of Christ with them. And you fell the test of faith. You also would fail the test of faith when you refuse to forgive. And you hold a grudge or you harbor bitterness or resentment or you fail the test of faith when you know the right thing to do, but you fail to do it anyway. You choose to do what is wrong. So like you know that you shouldn't give in to lust. You shouldn't compromise your purity because it's going to lead to, to harm both in the present and in the future. But you click that link anyway and you, fall, you, you move into indulging in something and you fail the test of faith. And then even like if none of that is convincing to you at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, after Jesus raises the standard and says, hey, faithfulness and holiness is not just about your external behavior, but the condition of your heart. Therefore, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We fell that test. Like, we, there's no way for us to live up to it. And so because of that, like, we are like Israel. And in the same way that Israel needed a deliverer, we need a deliverer. You need a deliverer. You are not David. You need a David. You need a deliverer. And that's where the good news in this story comes in because we see as the nation, the army of Israel, the king of Israel, all fell the test of faith. God, out of his grace and mercy and kindness towards them, raises up a deliverer. And in verses 12 through 19, I'll just summarize this. God, who does God raise up as a deliverer? He doesn't raise up some mighty warrior. He raises up a, just a little shepherd boy. And he, he's not... Uh, you know, he was the youngest of eight sons. The only reason that he ended up at the battle is because his dad sent him on a grocery run to deliver bread and cheese to his brothers and, their, and, the, and the commander of the army. And, and even as he uh, kind of uh, shows up and begins to uh, run to the battle line to see what's going on, to deliver the, the, the groceries that he had brought and engaged with people, no, nobody sees him as anything insignificant because they are also, they're also focused on the size of Goliath that they, when, when David shows up and Goliath comes out, they all flee in fear um, because they're focused on the size of Goliath. David responds not by focusing on the size of Goliath, but by focusing on the size of God. And in verse 26, he tells the army of Israel, the people that he was around when, when he showed up, he tells them this. He says, And David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine, the one who comes out and is taunting and defying us? What will come for the person who kills him and takes away the reproach of Israel? And he says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? You see, the, the army of Israel was focused on the size of their enemy, the size of Goliath, but David was focused on the size of God. And then in the same way as he, he tells that, his brother uh, begins to mock him and say like, aren't you just a little shepherd boy who has a few little sheep? Shouldn't you concern yourself with that? There's nothing you can do about this. But then David responds in faith so much so that they bring him in front of the king and he tells the king something similar. In verse 31, it says, when the words of which David spoke were heard, they, they told them to Saul, who was the king, and Saul sent for David. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of, of him on account of Goliath, for your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But then even as he tells the king, this little shepherd boy, like, what is he going to do? Like, Goliath is a warrior. He's a champion, and this is the little shepherd boy. What is he going to do? 
Saul doubts him just like his brother did. And Saul says, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth. And so you just see uh, the need for God to intervene and raise up this deliverer. And God chooses someone that if you would have lined up, everybody that was there that day would have been the very last person that anyone would have ever chose to be the deliverer for Israel. But David responds, not by fear, but by faith. And he recalls, when he responds to Saul, he recalls that his faith has been tested before. And he, and he has seen the faithfulness of God. And so he recalls these things in terms of why he is ready to move forward in faith and not in fear. And in verse 33, he says this, says, Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And then David gives credit for his previous victories to the place that it belongs. And David said, the Lord, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. But even as Saul tells David to go, he then tries to get David to go and and fight in such a way that he would. And he tries to put all this armor on him and kind of weighs him down. And David's like, hey, this isn't going to work. Like, this is not who I am. Like, I can't fight in these things. Let me fight in the way that God has prepared me to fight. And he goes and he gathers up five smooth stones from the brook in the valley. And, uh, you know, you think stones, when when I first read this story, I was thinking like pebbles. But, but it, was like, it was more like a stone. It was in Israel um, a year or two ago, and we went to that same brook and gathered a stone from it. And uh, this thing weighs at least a pound. And, and you can imagine that uh, if this thing get, gets chunked at you, that it could be a, a formidable weapon, especially if it comes out with any velocity. And so David goes and he, he gathers up these smooth stones and he grabs his sl- sling and, and he approaches the Philistine. He approaches Goliath. And then the Philistine came on and approached David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and was ready with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine, Goliath, said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And then the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So he blasphemed. The Philistine then also said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. In this day, the Lord will deliver me, will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly, both in Israel and in Philistine, may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And then in verse 48, it says, Then it happened. And so they come to this standoff moment. They're done exchanging words. The enemy of Goliath taunts and mocks David, doubts his ability to do anything. David declares his confidence in the Lord and says, hey, I'm not focused on you. I'm focused on one who's much greater than you. And he moves forward in faith and not in fear. And the battle is on. And it says, when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took the stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine on his forehead and the stone sank deep into his forehead so that he fell his face 
on the ground. And thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And you see God raise up this deliverer who is the least likely to be chosen out of a lineup to be the one used of God to deliver the army of Israel to kill Goliath. What's also interesting is as uh, Goliath blasphemed and cursed God, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament law, the penalty for uh, blasphemy was stoning. And so God took Goliath out with the penalty that he had already declared being a stone. And then it says that uh, when that David then ran over and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And so we see that God raises up this deliverer to rescue his people. And he, he does so by raising up one of the most least likely people to be chosen to rescue and to deliver um, his people. And uh, in the same way that God raised up a deliverer for Israel, God has also raised up a deliverer for us. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus, even as we read the story of David and Goliath, David is a type, a typology, a type of Jesus. He foreshadows a greater or a better deliverer that was to come. And in the same way, like you can see lots of similarities between David and Jesus, but then there are a few ways where we see that Jesus was a better deliverer. But they were similar in that as David was the least likely to be the deliverer, so was Jesus. This is what Isaiah chapter 53 says about Jesus. It says that Jesus grew up before God like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. And so there was nothing like when you would look upon Jesus that would say, like, that's the one that's going to set the captives free. Like it just, it, it wasn't that. And so in that way, David was a type of Christ. Also, in the same way that David was tested in the wilderness, Jesus was tested in the wilderness. In the same way that David was a shepherd, Jesus was a shepherd. But here's where there's a distinction between the two. David was imperfect. If you just keep reading in his story, you're going to see that he's an adulterer, that he's a murderer, and that he is an imperfect man. But Jesus is perfect and perfectly fulfilled the law on your behalf. And we'll also see that the re another reason why Jesus is a better deliverer is because David's victory over Goliath, uh, one victory for all of his people for that one day. But Jesus's victory over death, over sin and death, gives us victory uh, for all time for those who have faith in him. So and in this way, uh, Jesus is a better David. And, uh, you know, we like to read ourselves into this story as David, but you don't want to be David. You don't want to be David. You, uh, you need the better David, who is Jesus. And so I just want to like, plead with you for a moment. Like If you're listening to this and um, you've been trying to be your own savior, your own deliverer, I just want to plead and ask you just to, just to surrender. And to see Jesus, see that your own need for deliverance, see Jesus for who he is, and to trust in him. And if you do that, your life will be changed. I also just want to circle back for a minute and give a little bit of clarity to what it is that Jesus delivers you from. Because as we look at this story, if we make ourselves out to be David, we can make Goliath into be any problem that we encounter. And therefore we can say that, hey, if I just have enough faith, God will deliver me from whatever problem is that's in front of me. And that's, that's just not true. Your, your Goliath, what, your, what Jesus has promised you deliverance from is not your unemployment or your singleness or your infertility or your cancer. He doesn't promise you that you're going to be completely set free and overcome you know, government overreach or that uh, when you stand up for truth, like you're going to be delivered from being labeled as a bigot or a racist or um, an oppressor or any of these things. He doesn't guarantee you any of that. Like that's not the promise of the story of David and Goliath. That's not what you should take out as an application. What you should take out as an application is that God has delivered you through Jesus from something far greater than any of those things. And it's from eternal separation from him. It's from eternal separation from him. And then because of that, we begin to respond. We begin to respond to that deliverance. And that's what we see. We see this story of David and Goliath in by the nation of Israel. These people who were once so fearful and who were fleeing from, from their challenge begin to be transformed and follow their deliverer. 
And in verses 52 through 54, as this story ends, we see that. It says, The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron and the slain Philistines uh, along the way, along to uh, Sharim and even to Gath and to Ekron. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. And then David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem and he put his weapon in his tent. But you see, as it says just in that first line, that after their deliverance by David, these fearful men in Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued. They followed their deliverer in victory. And in the same way that uh, Israel responds to, to the deliverance by following their deliverer, we should respond in the same way to our deliverance in Jesus Christ. And so my last point would just be that we respond to our deliverance by becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. Like in the same way that Israel's immediate response was this passionate, uh, zealous pursuit to follow their deliverer, ours is to be the same way. And anybody that truly understands what Jesus has delivered us from moves forward to follow him in full devotion. But the real question is, do we? Like, do we actually do that? Like if someone was to observe your life, for a week, for a month. And then they were to write down their observations of how, you've, how you are responding to being delivered through Jesus Christ. What would they say? Would they say that you rose with a shout and have followed him into, into the battle to advance his kingdom? Or would they say that you just kind of wandered back into your sin? Kind of went about doing your own thing. Unfortunately, that could be all too often true of us. It could be true of you. And if that's the case, I want to encourage you to examine if you truly understand what you've been delivered from. Because a right response to being delivered by Jesus from our sin, to being separated from God for all eternity, a right response to that is nothing short of full devotion. And when Jesus came, he came to bring salvation. He came to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he came to call those who are saved by his grace to then follow him and to bring the message of truth, the message of the gospel, the message of life to all those that are around us. And so following, responding to deliverance and following Jesus looks like seeking and extending forgiveness to those who have harmed us. It means sharing your testimony of deliverance to everybody who's around you, never shrinking back in fear. It means standing for biblical truth in a secular society that's trying to push all kinds of laws and agendas that are only going to lead to destruction in people's lives. But we have the answer, and so we stand for truth. And yes, we may get labeled, we may get persecuted, we may have to suffer for it, but it doesn't matter because we've already won in Christ. And this world is not our home. We follow Jesus in full devotion by seeking the welfare of the city that is around us through service, through not living for ourselves, but living to serve and be and love others. And here's why this matters, because there are hundreds and thousands of people around us in our cities who are lost and who have not been delivered from the penalty of eternal separation from God because of their sin and who don't know of this deliverer, who is Jesus, who came to set them free. And God wants to use you to tell them. He wants you to follow him into the battle to make a difference. And so Watermark, as we in Fort Worth now begin to launch out into independence, we we have a commitment that we want to make to you. And that commitment is that we will continue in our full devotion to be uh, all about responding to the deliverance that we've had in Jesus Christ, to be about advancing his kingdom, standing firm as the seculation of our society moves in, but standing firm in the faith. And uh, Todd, as we, just in the past few weeks, has spent a little bit of time together. He said, hey, Briggs, if uh, y'all are going to keep the name Watermark and if we're going to do this independence thing, I just need y'all to make one commitment to me. And he said, just don't go liberal on us. And what he means by that is don't punt on orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And, uh, and we won't. 
we will be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil is not in vain in the Lord. And so the rest of Watermark, Dallas, Frisco, Plano, uh, as we move forward in the mission, we want to leave you with a charge as we've made our commitment, and that's to stay faithful and to stand firm. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for all that you've done for us through our great, our better deliverer, Jesus Christ. God, I just pray that you would use this message, this truth, this story in your scriptures to convict people, to see that they are not strong enough on their own to deliver themselves. And also pray, God, that you would use it to give us a charge to follow hard after you to be about standing for truth, to be unashamed of the gospel, to share it with passion and zeal and vigor without fear, to advance your name for your glory. So God, would you help us? Would you lead us? Would you help us continue to advance your name for your glory? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, friends. Have a great week of worship.